Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name is Michelle, and I am an alcoholic. My sobriety date is 1116 of 1990, and my home group is the Money Night Action Group which I'm very, 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 very proud to be a part of this morning. It's awesome part to be a part of Green Lake, something that Monday Night puts on, and it is um, just awesome to stand up here and tell you that that's my home group that did it this weekend because it's awesome. It's been a great time. Um, I had a great time, and every time I come to Green Lake, it's a great time. So I'm proud of that this morning. yeah, usually um, my little icebreaker is that, uh, you know, most of the time, 99% of the time, I suppose, um, I'm usually more worried about my outfit and my hair than I am about what I'm going to say, you know, because I, I know you're going to look at that. And um, and then you get up and the podium hides it all, so it doesn't really matter. I could have come in my sweatpants. But I dress up because that's part of my respect for Alcoholics Anonymous. I stand up here and I dress up because I respect Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, so, gosh, what it was like, what happened and what it's like today. You know, it was crazy. It was like anybody else's drunk log that's sitting out there today. You know, there's a lot of people in here. A lot more than I remember on Sunday mornings. Usually we dragged ourselves in at 10 o'clock. Um... My my story is a lot like all of yours. You know, I, I grew up in an alcoholic home. I um, lived with my mom and, and many different men that she chose to live with. And um, what happened for me was that, you know, my mom was just like Christy's mom. You know, I drank with my mom. I, I partied with my mom. You know, she made some bad decisions, and and I made them with her. And what happened was that she she was young when she had me. She was about 15. So really the mentality was of mine. And so we, we were good friends for a long time in my using. And what worked for me was I lived a life of, of um, physical, mental, and sexual abuse. You know, my mom had invited many, many men into her life, into our home. And... Um, different, thing hap- different things happened when I was young. Craziness happened. And... Um, for my mom, what happened was she decided that she was going to marry this man and she was going to have another child and, and that was going to make it all better. And, and she got married and, and had my brother and it wasn't any better. We um, lived a life like Mickey was talking about. You know, um, my mom was the one that said, I'm going to get a loaf of bread and didn't come back. You know, and so I spent a lot of time taking care of my brother, and I spent a lot of time growing up knowing that um, abuse was okay, thinking that abuse was okay, knowing that what what women were to do was, or what women were to put here to do was, you know, to be of servant to men and to um, be abused, to be taken um, advantage of on a daily basis, to be beat up on a daily basis, and... That's how it was supposed to be. I didn't know that it was any different than that. When I started getting into grade school was when I I was about nine years old when my mom introduced me to my first drug. And um, it wasn't fun. It wasn't, you know, spectacular. The lights didn't spin. Nothing happened great for me. But it changed my insides. Something that um, I wanted to do all of my life was change my insides. You know, I, I hated how my insides felt. So anything I could do to change my insides would feel better. And so I started to use with my mom. And I was about nine years old that first time. And, you know, I began to realize that I could make any situation different with that drink or a drug. I could make any situation different. The times that I was being beaten, the times that I was being abused were different if I wasn't there mentally. If I was using, it wasn't that bad, you know. I I really didn't think about it so much. So I grew up believing that um, that was how my life was going to be. I grew up believing that I would marry a man that beat me, that beat my children and sexually abused them because That's how it was supposed to be. I did not think that there was any other kind of life out there. What happened for me was I started going to, um, I went to public school and I started going to some, you know, some, 
now in schools they talk about that. They talk about, you know, you know, being hurt by a stranger and being hurt by, you know, and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, wow, that's bad if you get hurt by a stranger. You know, if it's in your own home, I mean, you know, they didn't really talk about that very much. They talked about, you know, if a stranger hurts you, this is what you should do. Well, I didn't have any strangers hurting me. I pretty much knew every one of them, you know, and so I didn't really think much about it. But I started to realize that something wasn't right about it. You know, I started to talk. I, of course, had some, you know, uh, friends in, in school and, and they didn't have the same experiences that I had. You know, and then their moms were there and they weren't drunk and falling over and puking all over the place. They were there and they were talking to them and helping them with their homework and all that crazy stuff that I didn't really understand. So I began really early to figure out that those weren't the people that I was supposed to be associating with because they didn't get it and they didn't understand. And early on I found a friend and, and somebody that lived in the same kind of situations that I lived in and we bonded and, and, and we lived and we partied and I loved it. You know, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, another part of my disease that eventually did get me to sobriety. Um, you know, what, what happened for me was I was 12 years old and I was, um, miserable and I was in control of my own life. I believed, I believed I was in control because I was starving myself to death by vomiting every day and starving every day. And I took a friend with me. And unfortunately one day we were, um, doing what we did every day after lunch and, and, taking control of our lives and, and, um, she vomited and, and she bled internally and, and she died on the bathroom floor in the restroom at my school. And, and that was a change in my drinking forever because I believed that, um, I didn't only have to drink for me and to live life for me, but now I had to live it for her too, because she wasn't here. So I had to make up all that, that, that drinking and that using time, you know, and so I did that. And I believed a lot of times I would take that drink and I would, and I would do that other stuff for her. You know, it's like, oh yeah, this is for you because you're missing it. You can't be here to experience this hell that I somehow have gotten myself into, you know, and so I moved and, and, and I moved, of course, immediately, you know, my, my best friend passes away from a disease that was killing her and they thought, well, maybe, it's affecting Michelle too. Well, no, I mean, I, I was okay. So they immediately sent me to a treatment center, which taught me a lot more tricks, you know, and people talk about going to jail and you learn a lot more about how to do more crimes, you know, how to do it better, not to get caught next time, you know, and I went to this treatment center and I learned how to do it better. Not to get busted next time, not to get put into a place like this, you know, and, and eventually I had spent my time there. I spent my 30 days there and they weren't letting me go and it wasn't getting any better and I wasn't doing what they were telling me to do. So I started to play the game. I started to learn, you know, I started to figure out that I had to hang spoons around my waist to weigh more on the scale so I could get out. I just wanted out. You know, and um, my mom picked me up on, on I, I think it was New Year's Eve or Christmas Eve, one of the two, and when we were to go on a family pass, and, and she brought me back, back so bombed that I wasn't allowed any more family visits, you know. And, um, yeah, so I just learned to play the game. I learned to do what they wanted me to do, you know, just to follow their rules so I could get out. And I remember walking out of there, and immediately, I mean, I walked out of the facility and puked in the garbage can, and... That was a bad idea, but I, I just wanted out, and that was my plan. And so I got out, and, and, and I was 12 years old, and I went on with my drinking, and I went on with um, using. And, you know, I realized at that point that something was different, that there was something different. I just didn't want it because I didn't know how to have that something different. The thing about my life at that point was that I had lived – in my situation for many years to the point where I didn't know how to live outside of that. I didn't feel comfortable living outside of that. You know, when, when they talk about, um, eventually they put me into a foster home and, and I, I kept running away from the foster home to go home to this place where I'll tell you was miserable. It was horrible, you know, and, but I kept running away to go back there because I didn't know how to live away from there. I knew how to live there. I was comfortable there. You know, I was comfortable knowing that, you know, today, you know, I'll get beat up and when it's over, it'll be all right and it'll be better. You know, when I went to this other people's house and they said, you know, everybody sits down at five o'clock for dinner. That's pretty funny. <laughs> you know, you all sit at the same dinner table 
you know, and they did. They all sat down, they all ate dinner, they held hands and said prayers. It was crazy, you know, and um, so I would run away and they would say to me, and Michelle, I just don't understand. We're trying to make it better for you. And I didn't understand either, but I knew it wasn't better over there because I didn't know how to live there and I was uncomfortable in my own skin there. And I knew how to live in the abuse and the craziness and the insanity. I knew how to live there already. You know, so at that point, I, I, I continued to grow in that situation. Some things got pretty bad in my life, in my, in my family. And I continued to drink. I got a job when I was 12 years old in a restaurant. And somebody said to me the other night, um, how much did you pay for a drink, Michelle? Isn't it worth it? I didn't pay for a lot of drinks. I stole a lot of drinks because I wasn't legal. How could I pay for a drink? I was never legal. I have never had a legal drink in my life. So I didn't pay for very much. I, um, I stole a lot of alcohol. I worked in a restaurant. My grandma had worked there for, you know, 30 years or something. She was part of the family. It was perfect. Many of her children had made some chaos there prior, so I would just add to the list, you know, and, um, stole a lot of alcohol and, and, and did a lot of crazy things with the people that I worked with. They were all older than me. I always felt like, um, I was better when I had that drink. I did everything better. Not only was I a better person on my insides anymore, which I found early on, I was a better person all around. I was friendly. I was talkative. I could dance. I could do all this stuff with all these people. I was older. I felt, you know, I was only 13 and 14 years old and I was working. I was drinking, but I was, I was much older. I fit right in with those waitresses that were smoking and I, I was just, I was a part of them. You know, it was like my little family. And I continued to go to school at that time. What happened for me eventually was that I had to um, take that edge off, unfortunately, on a daily basis. You know, I couldn't, I, I was no longer able to participate on a daily basis without that alcohol. You know, I thought that I really used the alcohol for fun and to be a part of and to have fun and to feel like I fit in and that I belonged. What eventually began to happen was that I would go to school and I would just need to take the edge off. Because it wasn't working for me. You know, those people didn't understand. And they didn't understand what it was like to live in my house. So I, I really just had to take the edge off. You know, and I did. I took the edge off every morning before I went to school. I took the edge off every first break we had. I took the edge off every first lunch we had. I took the edge off at break. You know, I, I, I just needed that little bit to get me through the day. You know, and, and I was convinced that it was all right. It was just taking the edge off. And it was it was kind of like pharmaceutical reasons, you know. And, um, so I, I, I continued on and I went to this class, you know, um, what happened for me was I decided that there was this in thing that they tried to institute in my high school and they, it was, a. Uh, Every time you, you used to have the smoking area. And those of you that are older know that we had this little smoking area and you could go out there and you could smoke and, and you come back in and you didn't get any trouble because it was the area. Well, what happened in my high school was they were going to ban the area while I was a junior. You know, wait a minute. You know, and so you got this fine every time you walked outside and you smoked. You, they would come around, these little security people, and they would fine you. And they said, if you join this class, you won't have to get a fine. You can join this class, and, and they won't fine you every time you walk out the door to smoke a cigarette. So I joined that class because I don't want to get a fine. And I met this lady, and they did a lot of crazy stuff in there. I had no intentions of quitting smoking. I mean, I just wanted to go there so I didn't get a fine. And so I, I, I continued to go to this little thing, and that they talked to me about was they wanted, first of all, they wanted me to write down what I was feeling when I wanted to smoke what I was feeling when I wanted to smoke. I have no idea what I'm feeling. I just want to smoke, you know. And um, yeah, I had no sensation of feeling, first of all. And second of all, my mom taught me one thing, and that one thing was that um, you never write down on a piece of paper that someday somebody could use against you, ever. And I knew that if I wrote something about feelings, somebody somewhere someday would use that against me. You know, so I wasn't about to do that. And so time went on, and then I came back, and she said, Michelle, you didn't write down how you were feeling. No, I'm good, you know. And, and, and the next thing she wanted me to do was read something, and I was to read it out loud. And eventually what happened for me was, um, yeah, I couldn't read. I was a junior in high school. I didn't know how to read, and I didn't know how to write, you know. And um, I could read a little bit, Dick, Met Jane, you know. I could read what I needed to to get by, I think. You know, I, I knew how to write down waitress orders and, and that kind of stuff. I didn't need to know much more than that as far as I was concerned. And 
And um, when she figured that out, they tested me. I was at a fourth grade reading level at that point in my life. And uh, this lady wanted to take the time to help me and to make it better. And, and some of the things that she did was um, she sat with me and she read with me. And, and she worked really hard at that. And and, and I worked hard. And, and eventually what happened was that I learned that she was an alcoholic and she was sober and she had this life. And I became part of that life. And I and I saw her and I saw her sober life and living and, and, and she didn't get abused every day and nobody beat her up every day. And it wasn't it wasn't so bad, you know. And so I thought to myself, I'm going to try this. I, I'm going to I'm going to try to get out. You know, my life had gotten to the point at home where. Um, I was pretty much done with, you know, it was over and, and I had to either decide whether I wanted to continue living that abusive life or to die, you know, and that was a hard decision. So I packed my bags and I said, you know, the thing about my drinking is that if you lived where I lived, you would drink too. Because you had to drink in order to get all that stuff to feel better. I, I, you know, that inside feeling, I felt horrible on the insides. And I guess I never really thought about the outsides when I was using at that point. You know, I, my outsides, I, I guess I didn't compare too much of my outsides, but my insides were bad. They felt bad. You know, they felt icky. I didn't like who I was at all. I didn't know who I was. You know, and so I, I decided that I was going to pack my bags and I was going to get out and, and I was going to live this life of this other alcoholic. And I wasn't going to drink anymore because I didn't have to drink. As soon as I left that abusive situation, I wouldn't have to take a drink. I only had to take a drink because I lived there and it needed to take the edge off and all those feelings to get better. And so I left and I, I lived in my car for a short period and then I lived with this person. And, and one of her rules, because she's an alcoholic, was that you can't drink. Well, that's not a problem because I'm not going to drink because I don't have to drink. And I drank. And I drank now because I was convinced that I was just experimenting. Because now I'm, I'm 16, and who's 16 and doesn't drink? You know, and all I did was I got another waitress job that had more booze and another bar, and, and, and I continued to drink there. You know, and she would get mad at me, and she would yell at me and scream at me, and I'd continue to drink, and, and, and I just really didn't understand what had happened. You know, I really was convinced that... You know, I was just using it for fun. Don't be upset. I didn't need it every day. You know, <clears throat> so I was wrong. You know, I, I I didn't understand that part of alcoholism. I didn't understand that, you know, wherever I go, it was to follow me. I didn't understand that concept. You know, I thought if I got out and everything was better, I wouldn't have to drink. So I got out and I and I continued to drink and and what happened for me eventually was there was a there was a multitude of things that happened at that time in my life but the big thing that changed what I did for the rest of my life was um, one of the things that they asked me to do was to talk to this gentleman that I had been involved in you know I told you that I believed that I would marry that man that would abuse me that would abuse my children and that's how I would live for the rest of my life so I dated that man I dated the man that beat me up abused me and um, I was to marry him. And I, when I decided that I was going to pack my bags and move out, my mom didn't want to have anything to do with me. She was finished. She was done. And um, I needed to talk to this gentleman about some situations. You know, they, they came to me and they said to me, you know, Michelle, you need to go home or you need to tell us why you won't go home. And I told them I wouldn't go home anymore. I had lived this life with this lady for three months where I went on trips and I didn't have to be afraid. I didn't have to be afraid of at night. I didn't have to wear my sweatpants and my sweatshirt um, in 90 degree weather because I was afraid of what was going to happen. I didn't have to live like that. So I had just a little piece of taste of what it was like to live not being abused on a daily basis. So I didn't want to go back there. So I made that decision that I was going to let them know why I wasn't going back. You know, and I told them, and, and, and at that point I made the decision, and, and, and my mom made the decision that that was the last time that, that I was to be a part of her life, too. You know, and that's how it, how it works in abusive families. If you step outside of that box, you're done. You know, and I knew that. I knew that all my life. It was not something that I went to unknown. I knew that if I opened my mouth and I told one thing about what happened in my home, that I would never be let back in that home. So I made that decision fully aware of what was to happen. And so one of the things that they asked me to do was to talk to this gentleman and um, and talk to him about about some situations that happened in my in my younger times and would he help me out in some some dealings that I had to have with the police and and I went to him and I and and we went out and at this point I was really trying hard. I was living with this recovering alcoholic who hated that I had to drink. 
And so I really tried hard. I thought, I'm going to really give it a shot. I'm going to give it a shot not to drink and not to use. And, and he took me to a drug house, which wasn't particularly the best place to be. So I, 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 he took me there, and I walked out, and I left, and he followed me, and we were talking about what I needed to talk about. And he said, you know, you just need to come home with me, and it'll be all better, Michelle. You know, and it's hard. It's, 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 it's torn. You know, you know how to live there, but you want to live here. And you don't know how to live here, but you somehow want that, you know. And so I went with him. I, I did what he asked, and I went with him. And that night he raped me and left me in a field. And it wasn't very close to my home. Um, he lived far away. And um, it wasn't something unknown to me, so I wasn't hysterical about what had happened. Um, what had happened, what made me upset was that I didn't know how to get out of that situation. I was far from home, and I didn't know what I was going to do, and I couldn't call this lady, and I couldn't tell her what had happened. And I didn't, I didn't premedicate myself, and that was hard for me. And so what I did was I, I just started walking. I started walking to where I needed to be. And, and, and I'll tell you, this changed my life forever because this lady, it was a lady, and she picked me up, and she was in a station wagon, and she picked me up, and um, she had no idea what was going on. I mean, I had blood everywhere. I mean, I could have just killed somebody, for God's sakes. And she said, if you sit in the back, I will take you where you need to go. And it was one of those old station wagons, like you could not get to the front from the back. <laughs> and she drove me where I needed to go, but I made her drop me off at the corner because I didn't want her to know where I lived. So the corner was close enough. And um, she took me where I needed to be, and I went in, and I showered, and, and that was done. It was over, and, and he wasn't going to do what I needed him to do for me. So I moved on, and, and four months later, I learned that, that I was pregnant. And I didn't know what I was going to do about that. You know, um, anybody that knows me knows that I really love children. And I really thought that somebody was talking about it the other day with me. You know, I, we have children because we think they're going to love us. And I needed that hole. I needed that something. So I wanted to have this baby because it would love me. You know, and I was going to do everything because I knew that, that my eating disorder and my alcoholism were going to kill that baby. I knew that. So I was doing to the best of my ability every day. I tried so hard not to drink. And I couldn't do it. But I was convinced somewhere, some way, that I wasn't an alcoholic like my mom because I didn't grow up like my mom. I wanted to be different. You know, and so I, I really tried hard. I tried not to drink and I tried not to use anything and it didn't work for me. I drank and I used and um, approximately four and a half months later I lost that baby. And today I know that that was God's plan and for whatever my life was to be to follow because that's what made me realize that something wasn't right. I didn't think I was an alcoholic, don't get me wrong. But I, I didn't think that something something wasn't right. I mean, I couldn't not do it on my own will. I couldn't do something that I really wanted to do. I couldn't stop drinking even though that's what I knew I had to do. I couldn't do it, you know? And so um, eventually I ended up in a treatment center, and that was per my request. You know, I went to this treatment center, and they told me that I was going to stay for 30 days. I entered that treatment center. I was 17 years old, and I weighed 77 pounds. And I entered the treatment center, and I remember sitting across from this doctor, and I ended, ended up going to a different hospital for a short period of time to get medically stable, and um, I came back, and I remember sitting across from this doctor and another therapist in the room, and, and they said, you know, we're not here to help you recover, Michelle. We're here to help the suffering be less, the dying be less painful. Because we don't think that you're going to make it, you know, that um, they, they weren't sure at that point that, that, that I was going to come back from where I had been. And I don't know. I mean, maybe they said that to everybody, because I'll tell you what, that was the fight of my life. And I knew that I was going to make it because nobody was going to make me not make it. And so I did everything I could. The thing that happened for me was that I really wanted to recover from my eating disorder that I knew was killing me, but I wasn't an alcoholic. And they did this assessment thing. And, um, you know, did you ever have a blackout is one of the questions. If you didn't have a blackout, you weren't a very fun drinker. You know, and that was my theory. I thought, everybody's done all of this stuff, and if they haven't, they're missing out. You know, it wasn't horrible that you blacked out. It was kind of fun. You know, you, you know and so I, I was convinced that, you know, it, wa it wasn't alcoholism that was killing me. It was my other disease at that point. And, and so I, I really, I stopped drinking while I was in the treatment center because I had to. And, and I was only going to be there for 30 days, so it was going to be all right. I'd figure it out for 30 days. 
And um, what happened was I, I took all those substances away from my body, and it was bad. My body didn't know how to be by itself without any drugs or alcohol. I didn't know how to walk. I didn't know how to talk. When they talk about coming to Alcoholics Anonymous and you have to learn everything over again, I had to learn those things, those simple little things that today I take for granted still. Just walking was a challenge for me because my whole body shook constantly. You know, and they said to me, it's going to get better, Michelle. It's going to get better. It took a long time to get better, you know, but I kept doing it and I kept staying sober. And what happens in the treatment center at that treatment center at that time was that if you didn't go to the AA meetings, you didn't get to use the phone. So as people well know, I went to the AA meetings because I wanted to use the phone. I still had a couple friends out there, you know, and, and I needed cigarettes and I, and, you know, and I needed this other stuff. So I needed to use the phone. So I, I went to the AA meetings and I went to the Oconomowoc AA meetings and they were some older, it was one meeting. It was a Friday night meeting and it was older gentlemen. And, and, and honest, I, I think one time I saw one other woman there and I thought, if this is AA, I'm 17 years old. I'm 17. You know, I can't be here with, I, and I, and I wasn't an alcoholic, so it didn't really matter. I just had to go to use the phone. And what these gentlemen would say, you know, is I'm blah, 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 and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm blah, 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 and I'm an alcoholic. He's driving me crazy because I, I, I never could say anything because I'm not an alcoholic. And finally, one time it came to my turn, and I, I it had been a few weeks. That's an irritating fly. It had been a few weeks, and finally I was frustrated, and I said to, I, I raised, when it came to my turn, I said, well, I'm Michelle, and I'm not an alcoholic. I'm here because the treatment center van brought me here, and if I don't come, I don't get to use the phone. <laughs> and they said, keep coming back, Michelle. <laughs> yeah. And I kept coming back because I needed to use the phone, and there was one old man in that meeting and, and, and every week now, I was so excited because I got to introduce myself. You know, and I said the same thing every week. You know, and this older man came up to me and he said to me, you know, Michelle, what I don't understand is if you're not an alcoholic, why you try so hard to convince everybody else that you're not. Well, because you're judging me. I know you're judging me. You know, and, and I tried so I mean, I, you know, I chased him down to tell him and explain why because I had an answer. But that he wasn't really asking me the question. You know, it's one of those questions they don't want the answer to. I didn't understand. Um, so it did make me think. It made me think a lot about why I tried so hard to convince other people I was an alcoholic. Why did I try so hard to convince you I was an alcoholic? Because I didn't want to be my mom. My mom was a bad drunk, and I wasn't like her. You know, and I knew I wasn't like her, so there was no way I could be an alcoholic. You know, and I didn't have the courage to say that I was an alcoholic of sorts. I didn't understand all that stuff. And I, I didn't understand that I didn't, just because I wasn't like my mom and her drinking and her drugging, didn't mean that I wasn't an alcoholic. So I kept going to the meetings because that's what I knew I needed to do. And 10 months after that, I left the treatment center. That 30 days turned into 10 months. You know, and one thing that happened to me in that treatment center was, um, I told you that when I made the decision to leave my house and to get a different life, to get sober, to change things, um, I also chose to leave my family behind. And so I was in this treatment center, and it was me. There was no going back. So I better figure it out. You know, and so what happened was that... Um, I always, I had that sense of, um, I didn't fit. I didn't belong. My mom didn't want me. She chose her all of her men over me. And, and, you know, I, I, I felt like I just, yeah, nobody wanted to take care of Michelle. You know, it was like, just fend for yourself and figure it out. And, um, I remember we went to court one day and I was only 17 and, and there's, there's a lot of laws, but you know, they said they opened it up to a courtroom of people, a courtroom of numb nuts that could, who knows? You know, and, 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 and the doctor was with me and the therapist was with me and they said, um, is anybody here today willing to take guardianship of Michelle? I mean, anybody. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, you opened it up to a courtroom, you know? And um, this tall, skinny doctor stood up and he said, I will. And I still remember that because somebody took responsibility for me. Somebody wanted me. 
you know, and I, I and I remember that. And he wanted me, and I asked him, does that mean I get the keys to the Saab and money for the movies? He said, no. <laughs> but somebody wanted me, and he kept me there, and they kept me in this little apartment. I was only 17, and I had to wait till I turned 18, and, and um, they moved me into my first apartment, and, and they bought me some toilet paper, some dishes. Yeah, that was it. And they moved me in. I think I had some silverware. But they moved me into this apartment. They said, okay, Michelle, you've been with us for 10 months and we've given you some awesome tools. Don't stop going to meetings and it'll get better. I had gone to meetings while I was there because that's what they told me to do. And I knew it was getting a little bit better. I, I, I went to meetings, though, and I didn't hold hands. I didn't touch. I didn't hug. It wasn't my thing. Um, I went to meetings at my Alano Club. I went to a lot of midnight meetings. The second shifters were awesome people. And um, really, if the meeting went longer than 8 to 9, you talk too much. And I left. I was done. It was over. And... Um, I got into this apartment, and I I, I really had experienced a lot. I had learned a lot in the treatment center. I learned a lot about myself. Um, I learned about who I was and what I could do to stay sober. And and they put me in this apartment, and I had my toilet paper and my dishes and nothing else. And no tools how to live out there, you know? So the first thing I did was I stopped going to meetings because, you know, that was a lot of work. And I was trying to figure out how to live with what I had in this apartment, and, um, you know, I, I, I went, I, one of the things that they told me was I needed to get a job where there wasn't alcohol involved. So I got a job and, and I drove to that job and that's what I did every day. I got up, I went to the job, I came home, I did nothing else. I got up, I went to the job, I came home, I did nothing else. People scared me. Everything scared me. You know, suddenly I came from this protected environment of a treatment center where there was constant 24 hour supervision and into this little apartment where I could do whatever I wanted to do, whenever I wanted to do it. And I didn't know how to live there. So all that fear came back and my legs shook, you know, and, um, yeah, so I didn't know what to do with myself. So eventually what happened was I, 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 I started going back to those meetings from eight to nine, not hugging, not touching, nothing like that. And, um, I started hanging out a little bit and I, I what happened was that I saw this group of people. It had, it had been a couple of years. I, I, I accumulated a couch and a chair. And it had been a couple of years. And, and I saw these people, and they were having fun, you know. They were, they were participating in softball that Christy talked about. And they were, they were having fun. They were going to dances. And they were doing all this stuff. And I wanted that. I wanted that. I didn't know how to find that, but I wanted that, you know. And so I followed that. I started to follow that. I, I went with those people. I played softball. I played, I was afraid of people and I was playing with a ball, you know, and I played softball and I showed up and I started doing the things that they did because they, they were having fun. They were happy, you know, and I got a sponsor who I thought was pretty because I wanted to be pretty. I wanted to grow up to be a pretty person someday. And she was pretty, so I was going to choose her as my sponsor. And she was pretty, so I'd be pretty someday. Because they told me if, if you want to find a sponsor, you got to want what they have. So I, I, I was a scared kid, and, and I started doing it, and I started following along. And they told me, I remember she said to me, she said, come to my house for this meeting. I have this meeting at my house, and you need to come. It's a really good meeting. I said, Okay. So I remember the first night, and I, I went to the meeting, and it was a lot of cars at that house. And so I drove around, and I drove around, and I drove around, and I called her later, and she said, you never came to the meeting. I said, I did. I was there. She said, it's funny. I didn't see you. I said, well, I drove around, I drove around, I drove around, and went home, you know? So I was there. I was at that meeting. But I, but I really started to get involved, and I started to make some connections with some people, and I started having a little bit of fun and learning that, you know, I didn't have to only go to work and go home and do nothing else because I was so afraid of what life was to bring out there. I was so afraid of that that I wasn't capable of doing anything else. You know, and the thing that always stopped me was that my legs shook, my body shook, and people kept saying, it's going to get better. It's been a couple of years, people. It's not much better. 
you know? So when does that get better? You know, and I talk about that because, you know, people think it's supposed to get better because I stopped drinking and it should be better within the next 30 days, but it's not how it works. That's not how it worked for me. It took a long time for it to get better. And I just had to keep coming back and I had to keep coming back and letting people laugh at me because I shook and I couldn't walk very fast or very far, you know? And, and one of the things that, that I learned was, uh, you know, that, that you had to sit in the chairs at this Monday night meeting that is now my home group. And, and so every Monday night, Dennis would meet me at the bottom of the stairs and he would walk me to the last row of chairs because my legs shook so bad. By the time I would have got to the front row of chairs, the meeting would have been over. So Dennis would offer his arm and I would walk to that last row of chairs and I would sit down in that chair would move the entire meeting and people would look and people would laugh and people would say, she's not going to make it. Look at that kid, you know? And I just kept coming back, and that's how it got better. Um, eventually, I moved on, and I, I got a new sponsor, and um, I started working the steps. And I started learning about who I was. I started learning about um, my insights that were so icky to me. I started learning about what they were and who they were and who I was. Remember, I said... It's not that I didn't like my insides. I didn't even know my insides because I never had an opportunity to figure out who I was. But I quickly learned that I didn't like who I was and I didn't like living in my own skin. And Mickey talked about that on Friday night. You know, it's that looking in that mirror and knowing that I don't like me. I don't like who I am. And every day I'd try to do it different so that I would like who I was, but I couldn't find that. I could never find that peace in looking in the mirror and liking myself. You know, and so... I started working the steps and it got better for me. I started working the steps and I kept going. I kept putting one foot in front of the other and I kept showing up and it got better. You know, and the, the one thing that they talked about um, when Amy asked me, she said, well, will you be the Sunday morning spiritual speaker? I thought, eh, sure, I'd be honored. But um, that was one part in my life that I really struggled with was God. How do you find God? You know, and and I, I didn't particularly care for God because I believed that if God was there, he would have taken me out of all of those situations a long time ago. That I would not have had to been in the situations I was in for as long as I was in them if there was a God. I believed that. You know, and so for a long time, when I went into the treatment center, I remember saying to them, if I have to believe when they have the steps on the wall, if I have to believe in God or a power greater than myself, I can't do this. I can't. I don't believe that. And they said to me, don't worry about that part. That'll come way later. And that's a good thing because I didn't worry about that part and it came later. You know, and I started working the steps and I, and I, I couldn't do that part. I couldn't do the God part. And so I believed in a lot of different things in my sobriety. I believed in doorknobs. I believed in people. I believed one thing that my sponsor told me was I believed that she believed. And still today when things aren't so good, I believe that my sponsor believes. When I lose that belief for those few minutes, sometimes still today, I believe that my sponsor believes or that my friends believe that it's going to be the way it needs to be. You know, it took a long time for me to find that. So I kept searching. And, and when I was working my steps, I kept searching for that power greater than myself. I used the group. I used the people. One plus one equals two. That's a power greater than you. And that's what my sponsor told me. And so that's what I did. If I talked to another alcoholic, that was, that was my power greater than myself for that day. And what happened for me, I can't honestly tell you that it was something that I did in action. But it was showing up and listening and doing what they told me to do. I still said those prayers that I thought were goofy. I didn't think that they were prayers. I just thought they were things you were supposed to say. So I wasn't praying. I was just saying what they told me to say every morning and every night. You know, and... And, and, and I thanked the group at the end of the day for my sobriety because I knew that's what had brought me here. And so eventually what happened for me was that over time, something had developed. You know, they said, believe that I believe and it will become your own. And I didn't know that that was really true. And I wasn't convinced of any of that. And that, that, that hitting your knees thing wasn't all it was cracked up to be for me, you know? And so, um, I kept believing that they believed. And one day I remember we were sitting in a meeting and they were talking about, about our, their higher power and their God. And, and I suddenly, I couldn't share. And I was crying because I had found that and I couldn't give it away yet. I wasn't ready to give it back because I found something. I found 
my higher power. And I couldn't share it at that point. I needed to keep it to myself. And it was amazing. It was this feeling inside myself that everything was going to be all right. You know, and it was incredible. And as time's gone on, I've been able to give that away and share that. The thing is that it didn't happen for me until I was about five years sober. And so I, I, I tell you, if you're out there and you're wondering and you're trying and you're struggling with that belief in your higher power, it doesn't always come quick. It takes a while. You know, it doesn't just because they tell you this is what you're supposed to do, you're going to, you know, believe in God tomorrow. You know, it takes us a while for it to become your own and just keep doing it. You know, because it took a while for me. And, and eventually, like I said, became my own. And I believe in that power greater than myself today who I choose to call God. Which can mean a number of different things for me. And so I, I, I continued to grow in the program. And one of the things that I always wanted to do when I was young, I, I wanted to go to school. And I wanted to continue on in college. I, I had struggled with high school. I graduated high school from my treatment facility that they put me in, and I graduated from there, and I wanted to go to college, but, you know, it was a little difficult when you only read at the fourth grade reading level to move on to the college end of things. So I applied, and I did what they needed me to do, and, and I kept going, and I kept, I, I went to the college, they accepted me, and I kept going, and I, I was convinced I was going to be a professional student. You know, and every week I would have trials and tribulations and I would call my sponsor and I would say to her, I can't do this anymore. You know, I'd go to the classroom where they used utensils to cut the pig and the lady would say, you can't use those, Michelle, because you're not safe. Your handshake, every time somebody talks loudly, you throw things. But I wanted desperately to be in that class. And I wanted desperately to be a part of those classes. And I, and I wanted so much to finish my, my, my career that I wanted to go. So my, I would call my sponsor and I would say, I'm not doing this anymore. This is too crazy, man. They locked me out of the classroom. I'm down there pounding out the window. They won't let me in. I can't do it anymore. I'm done. And she'd say, no, tomorrow you're going to get up and you're going to get dressed and you're going to go to school because that's what you're supposed to do. And the next day I would eventually get up and I would get dressed and I'd go back to school and they'd lock me out of the classroom. I'd call my sponsor and say, I'm not doing this anymore. They locked me out again. I was standing down there, pounding on the door. They're laughing at me. And eventually, you know, I did. I kept going. I kept going. And one day they said to me, Michelle, you're going to graduate. You're going to graduate. And I thought, are you sure? <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. You know, by this time, I'm doing some of my work, you know, I, I've done some work, I'm still living in my little apartment, but I've accumulated some things, and I've accumulated some things about me. I've started to learn about me, I've started to feel a little bit more comfortable in my own skin, I started working those steps, and I started to learn that my insides were okay exactly the way they were. I didn't have to medicate them to make them different anymore. You know, I started to learn that they all were all right, you know, and those feelings and those emotions were all right. You know, that they weren't bad things to have and that I didn't need to medicate them to make them go away or to sedate them like I thought I had to do. They were okay things, and I was okay on my inside. So I started to really think that. I started to look in the mirror and know that my insides were okay. So that's what I learned as I was continuing on my journey of school, and I continued to go to AA, and I continued to get involved. You know, it was about getting involved for me. I love the service part of Alcoholics Anonymous. I love it. Because what getting involved does for me on my insides is amazing. It makes me feel like I'm a person, like I'm whole, I'm productive, and I get to be here, and I get to be a part of this really awesome thing. So the service part is important for me to continue to be involved in. I continue to go to school. I continued, and they told me that I was going to graduate, and I was pretty shocked about that. At this point in my life, the shaking had stopped a bit, and I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to walk all the way up to that stage in front of all these people, and I'm going to walk all the way across the stage, and I'm going to accept my diploma. I'm going to do it. You know, and, and they said to me, you can do it, Michelle, and, and, and I wasn't quite convinced, you know, because my legs were still a little shaky. But I did it, and I went up there, and I accepted that, and I came down, and, and it was unbelievable to me. I really never thought those things could happen for me, ever. You know? So I got my degree, and I, and I wanted to be a nurse, and that's what I went. I went, and I became a nurse, and it took me seven years to do that. That's all right. And um, 
I became a nurse and I, I said to my friends, now remember, the lady wouldn't let me in her classroom because my throwing experiences. And so I told my friends, I came home and I said, I got a job. And they said, you did? I said, yeah, I'm going to work in the emergency room. <laughs> and they said, you're what? I said, I'm going to work in the emergency room. I'm really excited. They were like, wow, they must not know anything about you. <laughs> But I was going to do it because that's what I wanted to do. And what Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me is I can do anything I want to do. All I have to do is put one foot in front of the other every day, and that's what happens for me. I can do anything with one foot in front of the other. I get up, I get dressed, and I show up, and it works for me. You know, so I did. I started working in the emergency room. It was a lot of work. It was hard. You know, there was people that didn't want me there. There was people that think that you shouldn't be there if you're a new nurse. And it was a lot of work. It was really hard for me, you know, and today I'm still there and I'm still doing it and I still love it, you know, and it, what happens for me is, is I still come home and I call my sponsor and I say, I can't do that tomorrow. I can't do that tomorrow. I can't. I'm going to quit because I hate them all. <laughs> and my sponsor says, no, 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 no. Tomorrow you're going to get up and you're going to get dressed and you're going to go back to work because that's what you're supposed to do. And that's what I do. You know, and the important part for me is that relationship with my sponsor has continued to grow to the point where I know that if I need something, I can call her. And that's what sponsorship is for me. When, you know, I got my first sponsor, I, I really thought she was pretty and I wanted to be like her and I wanted to be as active as her. And today my sponsor, you know, is active and, and I continue to, to reach for that. I continue to reach for that respect that she has. I continue to reach for the involvement. And that's, and that's what keeps me calling her when I, when I need something. I know I can call and I'll get what I need. And, and, um, so I continue to put that one foot in front of the other like she told me to do and things happen for me. Um, Lo and behold, you know, I, I really, I never thought that, you know, um, ever in sobriety that, that marriage was out there for me. I, you know, um, I, I liked, you know, going to dances till three o'clock in the morning and all that stuff, but I wasn't really all, um, the whole relationship thing wasn't always really cracked up to be. And so I met a man and, and he said to me one day, will you marry me? And I thought, are you sure you know what you're getting into? You know, and, um. He still wanted to marry me with all my stuff, you know, and, and we got married and, and we decided that we were going to have a baby. And one thing that I'll tell you is that, you know, something I struggled with, something I struggled with just a few years back was, why do I keep coming back to meetings? Why do I keep coming here? This is hard for me. You know, now Alcoholics Anonymous has given me this really, really awesome life. It has given it to me and said, you do with it as you will. And I've grown and I've done things and I participated. But now suddenly I think that my life is full and Alcoholics Anonymous is the first to go, you know, because it's filled up. And so I think I don't need to go to all those meetings anymore because it's a lot of work. You know, I work all day, you know, and then I have to go to the meeting, I have to make supper, all that crazy stuff. And, um... So I was thinking about that, and I, I really, you know, I called my sponsor, I evaluated, why do I keep coming here? And what do I need, and what am I missing? Am I getting what I need? All that stuff, all those questions that you ask yourself. And, and what I come here for is because, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, of course, but this, 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 at this time, this revelation that I had was, I come because I don't know how to live today. You teach me every day how to live today. And maybe I could make it for a day without learning something different. But every day, I learn something different. Every day, I grow a little bit when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. When I stop coming, I stop growing. And I don't want to do that. What happened for me was I married a man, and I was to have a baby. And I remember saying to my sponsor, I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. I am six months pregnant, and I can't do this. You missed something. I can't do it. You know, and I can't deliver this baby. I, 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 I can't. You know, and I went to the doctor. My husband and I went to the doctor. I said, I can't, I can't do this part. I can't have the baby. You're going to have to figure that out. You know, and she said, it's a little late now, Michelle. You're, you're, 
Six months along. I said, can't we volunteer for an emergency C or for a C-section? No. Come on, I don't think I can do it, you know? And I came back and I, and I, and I said those things and people said to me, it's all right. You'll make it, Michelle. It'll work out. It'll be the way it's supposed to be and it's going to work out. And as time got closer and time got closer, I still was convinced I couldn't do it, you know? And eventually I had a C-section, so I didn't have to do it. It wasn't so bad. <laughs> you know, and, and, and people walked through it with me every step of the way. And when I brought that baby home, you know, that motherhood thing is instinctual. What do you have to learn about being a mom? A lot. It's not very instinctual. And anybody that thinks it is, it's not. Men. And... um <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work and I remember calling my sponsor and I, and I said to her this isn't all it's cracked up to be she's cute not that cute <laughs> and she was crying and she was screaming and I thought what in the world am I doing wrong what in the world I, I don't know how to do this I didn't have much of an example and my sponsor told me you know you, you put the baby down and go for a walk I Go for a walk. I went for a walk. I half blocked down. That baby was still screaming. I could hear her. I had not to worry that she was harmed. I came back, and it wasn't so bad, and I loved her a little bit more than when I left. And um, it was a lot of work. But what happens for me is that I keep coming back. You know, I, I keep coming back, and people keep telling me, this is what you do, Michelle. This is what you try, Michelle. This is what you do. This is what you do next time, and this is what you try. And maybe that will work. But I keep coming back here because all of you have walked before me. And I learn from you. And I take that with me. And I go home and I use that. Not even just with my baby, but with everything. I'm married to another alcoholic. That's a lot of work. You know? Two programs in one house is little. You know? And so it's constant, you know, it's, it's work. And that's why I keep coming back because I have to come here so that you can teach me what I'm supposed to do today. Because I still cannot function every day on life's terms without you telling me tomorrow you need to get up and put your socks and shoes on and go to work because that's what you're supposed to do. A lot of times I go to meetings and I say, I don't want to be here but I'm supposed to be here. I put my shoes on to come to the meeting. And my sponsor always told me, if you go to the meeting and you really don't want to be there, you can leave. But that's not the point. See, once I got there, it wasn't really that bad. I liked being there. I just didn't want to get off my couch and go. You know, so that's why I keep coming back to meetings and I continue to grow in my spirituality. You know, my, my, I, I explained to you that my higher power was a struggle for me and my God was a struggle for me. I really had a hard time with that, understanding that concept and embracing that. And today, you know, things go bad and, and I'm the first one to hit my knees. You know, something happens bad in the emergency room and I'm in the bathroom asking for God's help. You know, and things today in my life. That's where I turn. You know, somebody talked about it. I can't remember. I know it was one of the 10 minute speakers, but they talked about my sponsor's not always going to be there. My sponsor's not always there. And so today I realized that, and I used to have all those people that I could call just in case. And, and cause my sponsor helped me every day get through a day. And I didn't know how I was going to live without talking to her every day. And today, I found that God that I can talk to, that I can take with me. That God fits in my pocket. That God fits in the bathroom. And I can take it with me every day, my God. And today I've, I've chosen to encourage my children to believe in God. Wow. You know, um, something that I could never have stomach to believe in. I tell my kid there's a God. And I have a stepdaughter that's eight years old, and, and, and she has many different facets of learning about God. You know, her grandparents are a different religion and, and this and that and and, and I just, and I, and, and it's hard and, and she doesn't always understand. And I explained to her that, uh, it doesn't matter who God is today. As long as you have somebody that's going to wait and make you help you on your way. That's all that matters for me today is that I have somebody that God, that person that I call God, you know, that helps me today, that I take along, you know, that goes to work with me so that, you know, today I don't so much struggle with taking a drink. I don't have the desire to take a drink. That obsession has been lifted for me, as it talks about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. That obsession has been lifted. I don't think, 
every minute about taking a drink to make it better. I'll tell you, when I was shaking and my body was shaking and I had to walk into meetings, I thought about that drink because I knew that was the only thing that could ever make that different. Those shakes like that, they would have been gone. I didn't have to go through all that. I could have drank in a heartbeat. Those shakes would have stopped. And instead, for five years, I put up with the shakes. You know, because I knew that's the only way to make it better. And and today I don't think about I don't think about taking that drink as much as I think about that ism that was talked about last night. You know, I get stuck in the ism today. You know, I don't I don't think about taking a drink and and letting alcohol run my life. But I'll tell you what, I struggle a lot with accepting people, places, and things today. You know, and 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 people in my life. And you know, I, it's so funny. I had no people in my life. Now I have all these people in my life, and I struggle with them too. You know, it's like no people, a lot of people, you know, it's like we're never happy, you know, and, and I, and I, 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 I struggle with, um, people, places and things. So today I, I love my job and I go to work and, and it, it's amazing to me. These, the, these girls, they don't live in AA. They don't work the program that you and I bro- work. They're not nice. They don't have to be nice to you. And they're not. And they say mean things to you. And they say mean things behind your back because they didn't hear the gossip rule. They didn't hear about that. They didn't hear about how much that hurts your feelings. And they didn't hear about resentment, that it kills people. They didn't hear about that. you know. And so they don't work my program. And I suddenly think, holy cow, you need a program. you know. And somehow, somewhere along the lines, I got better than those people. And I don't fit. You know, and, and, and I'm not better than those people today. All that's different is that I come to Alcoholics Anonymous and I can talk about it. And I, sometimes I pray for those people that they find some kind of program. But today, the important part for me is that I go out there and be the example that I don't participate in. I be the example. But those are the things I struggle with today are the people that I work with, the places that, you know, the things I have to do in the real world today. You know, I call my sponsor and I say, I can't believe they're going to make me do this. They can't make me do this. Well, they can. That's what they do when you go to work every day and you have a real job and you get paid real money. They can make you do pretty much anything. I think, well, that's not working out for me, you know. And the real thing for me, it's hard. I remember when I went to this lady's house for the first time, jumping back a little bit, I remember when I went to the sober alcoholic's house before I ever received any treatment, one of the rules that she had was that you couldn't drink, but you had to be in by 11 o'clock. That's funny. You know, so I've never been a big rule follower. I never was very good at the 11 o'clock curfew. And um, the thing about today and the difference about today in my life is that I continue to suit up and show up and put one foot in front of the other, and that's how it works for me. You know, I keep coming back because you give me everything I need. You know, you teach me how to do it tomorrow, you know, and still today, you know, I said yesterday we were in the, in the meeting in the field and somebody was watching my daughter and, and, and I come here and when I'm lost and I don't know what I'm doing and, and people pick up where my family of origin left off, somebody picks up my baby and, and, and they comfort her and they hold her. And I said to my sponsor just a few weeks back, um, I was at her house and I said, um, she said, she's really cute. I really love her, Michelle. That baby has more love than I could ever imagine any person having because I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I come here and all of you love her just because you love her, which is amazing to me. You know, and this is my family. I said, my my family of Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I still haven't chosen to go back and be any part of that family, and that's okay with me today. And I stay here and this is my family today. This is the community that I choose to be a part of. This is the community that, you know, put my wedding together, that was standing at the birthing window the day my daughter was born. This is my family. This is where I belong. So I hope that you got what you needed today, but all I know is I keep coming back because I need to learn every day more and more stuff. I need to learn how to do what you guys do. And that's why I keep coming back. And with that, I'll pass.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.